I'm so excited, and I feel like we should, you know, collect what we've said here and probably publish it somewhere and go ahead with some of these concepts that have emerged because they're not the same old concepts that usually emerge under the heading of feminism. Um, part of it is this transnational focus that Esther's really getting us to focus on how do we produce the notion of development versus underdevelopment, uh, um, skilled versus unskilled. These are categories that we need the feminist uh, critique of. But the other thing, there, there are a couple of ways of thinking about feminism in relationship to what has gone on here. One, people are really calling attention to the way in which feminism has been part of colonial projects, knowledge projects often, as well as political or activist projects that simply adhere to the same old colonial logics of, um, of rule without really disturbing uh, any of the social actors involved. So we're very clear that we need a different kind of feminism, feminism that is not attached to colonial epistemologies. But on the other hand, a lot of what's gone on on this panel is providing new frameworks for thinking uh, about the environment, about global labor, about occupation, right, about militarism, that will go completely unnoticed by some of the mainstream discourses in those fields. And that's where you see this double bind of feminism on the one hand being a kind of global discourse, and on the other hand remaining marginalized. So that when somebody wants a quotation on something in the press, instead of going to Shiloh, you know, then they're going to go to Zizek. Or instead of going to uh, Esther, they're going to go to, I don't know, Stanley Fish or Fred Jameson or somebody. Um, we, there's a way in which, mm, you know, the term feminism is really important, but also it maybe keeps us locked into a dynamic with some other kind of discourse that is still the mainstream uh, that I think we really need to think about so that we're not always the addendum or the afterthought to a discourse that's gone on as a sort of master discourse. There are a few key terms that have come up here that I just want to introduce into the conversation. You mean suggested that futurity is um, one way that we might want to think uh, in relationship to feminism, and there are many critiques of futurity that have come out of queer studies, and I think Shiloh's work has just given us another uh, way of thinking about futurity in relationship to inevitable environmental degradation. Um, the way in which we are surrounded by environmental degradation, we know about it, but we still don't act upon it, might influence what we even mean by a future. Um, there are, I know there are a lot of people who feel like certain political projects are not worthwhile anymore because the human race is about to run out or is at least on an arc where you can begin to imagine finitude. Um, and that's not, for me, a philosophical concept from Badieu. That's actually a really important environmental concept that provides a certain kind of urgency to the political projects we take on, separate from just their life within uh, the university. The other term, Esther brought it up, the norm. In my book, Gaga Feminism, I say, we've reached the end of a particular knowledge paradigm that depends upon the norm. Foucault called that disciplinarity, and he suggested that certain forms of knowing that emerged in the 19th century depend upon the population orienting themselves to an idealized norm in order to be self-governing. But we know we don't live in that era of disciplinarity anymore. We live in a bio-political regime. People don't care that much about norms. And um, in fact, power is as easily leveraged through differences as it is through similarities. So we do need new critical vocabularies. And the norm is not that helpful any longer in thinking about how it is that people experience differential levels of privilege, oppression, access to power, or relationship to incarceration, and so on, okay? So the norm seems to me is done for. I like this idea of transnatural ethics, and I would like to ask um, Charlotte to tell us more about that. It seems to me, as I understood it, was something to do with having a relationship to the environment that recognizes uh, contamination, pollution, but doesn't dream of a purity that one would return to by producing a new class of deviance or a new set of deviant subjects, this time who are contaminated as opposed to those who have been pathologized in relationship to a norm. The, uh, the two last terms, messiness has come up as a critical term several times today. Messiness isn't a critical term already, but it's amazing to me how many people reference messiness in rather than say using a term like complexity. Um, and that's because complexity suggests a degree of difficulty 
without giving us a sense of the disorder of things, that we need to be in relationship to epistemologically because new ways of theorizing are going to come out of not knowing. I heard Cynthia say that, I heard Shiloh say that, um, I, I heard Esther say that in certain ways. I heard everybody on this panel say something about not knowing, not being certain, not being sure, and then being in relationship to messiness without wanting to clean it up, which probably is a transnatural uh, ethics as well. Finally, this category of complicity for me is enhanced by these uh, different frameworks that people have given to it, whether it's the transnational marketing of girl bodies, whether it's the occupation of Palestinian territories uh, by Israel, whether it's about militarism across the globe separate from uniformed militarism. Complicity in Shiloh's case, though, was contamination. And here's the thing about contamination. When you're in relationship to pollution, you can't not be contaminated. There isn't a space where people are not contaminated. So thinking about complicity in relationship to an environment gives us access to a different kind of ecology, right? Maybe we need a politics that is more of an ecology than a, a political economy, a political ecology that understands sets of relations that are determined environmentally or epigenetically rather than simply sets of relations that are determined through singularities, through particularities and through location. So if we were really clear here today, we probably have produced new languages and a new set of frameworks that I hope we would be able to take elsewhere and do some good work with. So. to 
be committed to a particular type of feminism, which I think the one word that I would take is less um, the question of how, maybe not, yes, I, I take it back. The, the word of responsibility. <laughs> how do we have responsible feminism, a feminism that can account to, to, um, to these questions of, of complicity? And, and here I think um, the question of recognizing where we are in, in these many, many different hierarchies of power is, is important. And this is the question that I think misses one of that, that gets us into the Swiss that I would like to hold on to, or what uh, Peter refers to as confusion. So, so maybe I want to end with this idea of, of holding on to confusion, to messiness, to our inability to say anything coherent or just raise all these very important questions that we identify with the answers. Um, and, and, and stay with them and linger with them for a while before we try to go on. I, I don't think you'd be selfish, but I think it's a little more time <laughs> to process. So I think there was a question. Um,
things that makes this gathering of all of us so special is that we're both here and not here. And I mean that in the sense of we're really celebrating something that's very particular to Georgetown, not just to the city, not even to just this larger university, but to something that has been created here by numbers of you and sustained by others of you here. So it's a very here-ness that, that is, I think, very special about this conference. We're not just kind of floating three feet off the ground and talking about that. So we're really talking about what does it mean to try and live and think and do as, a, as feminists in a very particular place, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. in 2012. And at the same time, we are very much not here. We are very much from Mexico and from Turkey and from Dominican Republic and from South Korea and from Kenya and from Israel. We are very much of the world as well. And it's that, some might call it tension. I don't see it as tension. I see it as vibrations, as a vibrancy. That is that we refuse to be either simply of here or simply of scattered theirs. But we are going to create a collective new understanding of how the world works and how we should act in the world from the here and the scattered therenesses. And I think that's something that really is not only of feminism, but feminism, I think, is a way of exploring our own lives and the lives of those that we share the planet with, um, has, from its start, said that you must be able to think small in order to think big. Not just that you have to be able to think big in order to think small, which is a very classic kind of masculinized intellectual way of understanding the world. Think about the big concepts and you'll understand their life, right? Whereas feminists very radically have said and still say to each other, think about the trivial. Think about the everyday. Think about your aunt's actions and what were behind them. Think about what it means to live every day in a landscape that has been corporately mined. Think about the minutia of life that everybody else says doesn't matter. And then out of that, build and understand, take it seriously, take everybody whose lives are really grounded in the everyday and use that as the basis for your understanding and your knowledge. Um, and I think it means that we are of Georgetown, we are of this program's enormous vitality here at Georgetown so that we can understand the larger world, not because the larger world mimics Georgetown, but if we can't understand what we're doing here, how can we possibly stretch our minds so that we can understand the diverse realities elsewhere? On the other hand, never imagine that Georgetown is the world. Right? <laughs> Which, of course, most universities would like us to believe, right? So we have to both be as here now as we can. Take your roommate seriously. Take what food is offered in the cafeteria seriously, right? Take every university slogan seriously, definitely to deconstruct. At the same time as you are thinking about drones and natalization and gold mining, and it's not one or the other. Um, so I'm just sorry, I was processing and some amazing things you said. Um, I think it's difficult for me being here in Georgetown, so, um, and I uh, wanted to kind of process some of these reflections. But in terms of the building concept, um, I think, um, I don't know, a bit in my talk I mentioned uh, the notions of sort of building publics and so forth, or forms of counter publicity. And so I kind of think of, I think of the building and this, this event. And, sense is just creating a kind of um, emerging sort of uh, 
public community um, that uh, you know is looking at uh, implementing a sense of this critical vocabulary and so forth. Um, and um, I think what's really fantastic about that is you know this instead of this kind of individualizing agency uh, and so forth um, that I typically feel as a junior faculty member here. Um, you know it, it's really uh, I, I just think of how much this sustains me as events like this and um, I don't know I think from where I'm from I thought oh you know I'll be in Washington D.C. where the government is you know the heart of the government and I'll be in Georgetown in a school of foreign service right with like security studies down the hall and this is like what I do I'm right next door you know to, to what I'm you know critiquing so to speak um, and I interact with people right all the time um, and so I you know I sometimes it can be quite difficult to sort of Keep going, I guess. With, you know, with that kind of um, interaction, when you feel like you're by yourself. And I'm, you know, originally when I was, I don't know why I'm talking about this actually in public. Sorry, <laughs> I'm fired, right? The tyranny of the job. But, <laughs> but, um, but you know, when I was hired, it was, you know, I'd just been finished grad school, and I was just um, made it before you know, the grand crash of 2008. And so there were supposed to be a bunch of lines of studying culture. But then the School of Foreign Service. School of Foreign Service finally had a line just about culture, right? So I was hired for that just to write these other lines, fizzled. Um, so, you know, still now, I'm the only person actually 100% hired under the banner of culture within a School of Foreign Service. Um, and, you know, uh, and what's really interesting is, you know, these you Georgetown students and all you folks know what I'm talking about. I did have an office for a while, and I was like, this crazy joke of the placeless geographer. So, so, I'm a nerdy geographer. But, um, but, um, but so, you know, I felt like I was doing this by myself, right? And so, you know, to me, I kind of thought, oh, I'm like this pirate radio station. I, the office I did get was in the basement behind, like, um, a secured wall that you couldn't really get to. Um, so I really just thought of myself as, like, this pirate radio station, I guess. And I was, yeah. Well, now, now I'm up in the fourth floor where we have Women's and Gender Studies, African Studies, English as a Second Language, and, and yes, and so we're all in the corner there, which is, I guess, nobody thought about that much, but, but anyway, so, you know, sometimes you build coalitions or, you know, even through events like this, sometimes they sort of happen by default, um, so anyways, I, I just really am very thankful for this event at all, and actually, uh, you know, professionally and personally, um, because uh, often here I feel like, sort of by myself. <laughs> so. Any other questions that you want to ask each other? I do, actually, because I, that was so off the cuff. I did have something to say about that. Um, because these are wonderful, wonderful papers. And I just saw the brief conversation. Um, two, two papers, even though I want to do so much and respond to so many. Uh, but, uh, so, Jack, your um, wonderful sort of articulation of the need for new ways of uh, inhabiting masculinity, not just today, but you know, in your work in general, has been so important to people. And I'm thinking also about, in, in, in conjunction with your critique of militarism, which I think has you know, not only inspired me, but you know, you know, been the foundation for so many careers. Um, how can we, can we sort of imagine more concretely, and this is just to help me, uh, masculinities that are uh, really sort of actively um, critical of militarism? And it's a simple question, and I think, you know, perhaps there are simple answers. But I think of militarism as actually going beyond, uh, as you well, have pointed out, uh, you know, beyond the military, obviously, it's uh, manufacturing, it's also sports. So when you brought up the example of volleyball, I laughed and then I thought to myself, but wait a second, you know, sports is organized around military metaphors, military practices are organized around sports, sporting metaphors. And so whenever I teach masculinity, I always have so much difficulty in sort of, sort of, you know, really showing its sort of interesting alternative configurations. And I think, you know, trans theorists have been so exciting in that respect. So I was just hoping you could say a little bit more, and you know, if you'd like to also just respond to what 
tracks theory work does to the way in which gender and masculinity is conceptualized. Okay, that's a great question. I mean, you know, masculinity, an implicit critique of masculinity is behind a lot of these uh, presentations. And I think, I mean, this is where, um, what, what I'm trying to say under the heading of, uh, in a sort of whimsical heading of Gaga feminism, what I'm trying to say is, it's ridiculous to analyze shifts and changes in the meaning of the category woman without recognizing that there will be associated shifts and changes in the category man. And if it's impossible if they're locked into a binary structure, then it's kind of impossible for there to be massive redefinitions in one place in that matrix and not have there be a very large impact uh, in the other. So there are a couple of different ways we could think about this. One is just that, um, again, separate from this biological imperative to reproduce, which seems to have reached its, its um, epistemological end, at any rate, as an organizing rubric for thinking about bodies in, in relationship to communities and societies and, and so on, then the meaning of gender must have shifted and changed. And I think that, I wouldn't say that all of the work under the heading of transgender studies is trying to grapple with that change, but the transgender body is really caught in the boundaries between these shifts and changes. Um, and so a lot of interesting work has come out of transgender studies, but the most interesting work has been a new way of work that is less interested again in the identity politics of who are these trans people, where do they come from, why do they do what they do, and more interested in the pressure that the trans body applies to the seemingly stable uh, um, normative locations of male and female. So Gail Salomon's uh, book, Assuming a Body, is a very good example. It's a phenomenological reading of gender, saying that when you think about the meaning of gender in relationship to a trans body, what you're really beginning to grapple with is the meaning of gender across a whole series of bodies, very few of which are normatively embodied. I mean, this is the honey boo boo paradigm that we've now been introduced to that I'm super excited to use in more locations, thank you. Um, so, so, you know, just to give an example, if you use this little rubric that I was presenting today of shifts in IVF technology has unintended consequences. At one end of the scale, women who could not get pregnant before get pregnant. At the other end of the scale, men have babies, okay? But in between that, there are a whole bunch of different shifts. So, for example, what will be the meaning of masculinity at the end of this next generation of boys being raised by often lesbian parents, but certainly some combination of single moms, lesbian parents, queer households, or divorced households? That has to have an impact on the meaning of boy. It has to. No matter how sure you are that there's some other kind of genetic imperative built into people's hardwiring, that simple adjustment, not simple, but long-term now adjustment that we can now see, will completely shift and change the meaning of masculinity. And here's the thing about futurity that a few people have mentioned. We really don't know what that future will be or what it will look like. And I think feminism has gotten itself into lots of trouble, different strands of feminism over the years by predicting things or prescribing things. The pre is never a good mode, it seems to me. So, Rather than saying, this new generation of boys will inevitably you know, undo the bonds between men and patriarchy, whatever, maybe. But more importantly, we should be unknowing about what kind of manhood is to come. Because when we're not unknowing, we ascribe the same old versions of masculinity to actually new boys and new men and new trans people and new genders that are around us. And we're not, we're not in active relationship to the newness of these genders now. So I very much like this idea of a futurity that is to come, that never really arrives. It's a sort of messianic, but messianic in a Benjaminian tradition or the messianic in a Christian tradition. The difference is that the Messiah never does come, so you never really do know, and you're always in relationship to a futurity that is forever forestalled. That's an interesting temporality to me, and that's a better temporality to start thinking about the what ifs that we're producing all time in our culture. I, I, this is the point at which I want to hear from you guys. Yeah. 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 
I'll, let me start off. So, okay, those of us who aren't from Georgetown, we wonder what's going on here. <laughs> so, for instance, um, we were just having this conversation about, is there some contest, um, some shifts, some confusion about what it means to be adopted um, at Georgetown? Is there any? Is there any? Or is, is it pretty fixed here and there's not much context? And if you don't like it, you know, transfer to fast. Um, so, well, what's going on here? Um, you know, when I mean, go out to Georgetown, um, I have to say this is <laughs> somebody who presents the way I do. Uh, <laughs> the most gender-conforming campus I've ever been at. <laughs> um, I have to say that, but I, as somebody who's the director of the LGBT Center, um, you know, somebody asked me a couple of years ago, it's been a phenomenal year for us, um, in, in, in the center has been quite successful, and somebody said, so, you know, what made it? And I said, you know, actually homophobia is not as big an issue here as old, good old-fashioned sexism, you know? Although sexism is related to homophobia, but you know, ultimately I have struggled here far more around this whole binary issue. And I looked around this campus and I I talk to students about this all the time that this is the most here, you know, men walk like men, talk like men, quack like men. <laughs> to the same. And it's a it's a very hard campus to be gender non-conforming in any fashion whatsoever, I think. I mean and I'm not even, um, and I've had to work a lot with some gender non-conforming students and faculty and staff, but I think there is a way in which we have very successfully reproduced that by the way, we keep that by the way in place um, in our everyday lives, in our everyday expression, but, um, but I, as somebody who's come from outside, I, I find, you know, I was at the University of Ireland, which is certainly not the most exciting or the most edgy campus, but it makes, Maryland is so edgy. Because <laughs> um, you only want to find people with colored hair, you don't find people with you know, painted nails, you, don't, you have no tattoos, you have no piercings. There's nothing. There is no experimentation. And I have no idea. I mean, the students have to tell us you know, what goes on here in, in terms of gender. I mean, I think that's the thing I struggle with the most here. But the, the other question that I had in common that I had with the panel was really about I feel that as, as somebody who Came, away, you know, came here in the early 80s. I think we as feminists have a very ambivalent relationship to power. And we continue to sort of, I think, use the language of marginalization, um, even though I don't think that is still, I don't know how, I, I'm not so sure that I feel that I feel marginalized anymore in the same way as I did in 1981 when I arrived as a foreign student. And yet, I don't think we have successfully known how to talk about our own acquisition or some arrival into power. And I would be curious to hear from any of you. I think we are very ambivalent about our own relationship to the increased power we do have, but we still invoke the language of marginalization. Good control here, let alone 
think about women in this sort of grand scale, what it really means um, to be gendered and to be of a different gender. So um, I guess my question really goes um, to how you think feminism um, will move forward and how it should move forward. Um, should we, should feminists sort of um, deal with this kind of very strict sense of women on this campus and kind of, um, kind of um, uh, fight for a larger idea? Or should um, um, feminist learning thinkers go into different movements, whether it's environmentalism or um, queer activism, and then kind of work through those sectors? Like, do you still think that feminism um, should be kind of like a unifying center which activists um, rally around, or do you have any other alternatives? Yeah. 
understanding of the situation. <coughs> and I argue that exactly because everything is linked. If you, and if I say, oh, I think I'm arguing for more historically and geographically specific um, feminist intervention and activism, by doing something like that, even if it might look like something that is very local, it can actually con socially contribute to unhinging of the whole thing, exactly because everything is linked. And so it's not a, just, just a reason for despair, but actually it can be that kind of a key, right, to, um, I don't know, again, the, the optimism of the will.
this is way, way, way above the plan. It's really not relevant to people who want to act. And I think this is precisely what we need to maintain if we want to hold on to activism despite this specificity, despite this risk, despite the fact that we never know what this will produce. So yes, to be completely committed to act, to change, and then to pause, reflect, think what it can produce, what it might not produce, and how to be channeled. This is a response to both the questions. Um, and indeed, the, the question about what feminism is. And I want to just make a plea for pluralizing the word and reminding us that feminism is often hyphenated. And so when you phrase your question as we should be to do feminism or environmentalism or you know, to me, the it's all of the above and they're you know, enmeshed. And they can be enmeshed in interesting even though they may contradict each other and be not sufficient in some, uh, in, in some sort of moments. Um, but to sort of pay attention to the fact that, you know, there are so many ways uh, to articulate feminism in the sense that you know, to connect feminism with other um, uh, struggle, activism, theory. And so to then respond to Shiva's question about power, Yes, there are some feminists who I think have a lot more power. And so I'm thinking of the big Atlantic story about women who have it all, and I read it, and I was just left so cold because I was like, okay, she's talking about a very small subset of women you know, who have those sets of problems. And they are real problems. I mean, uh, and this is not to trivialize the issues, but the problem is she speaks in the name of all feminism, right? And that's what we have to guard against, to sort of speak of feminism in the singular, to remind ourselves that that is an upper middle class feminism uh, you know, that has benefited from some of the changes that have been in place in the last 20 years uh, that were fought for. But at the same time, you know, to really be guarded when people claim to speak in the name of all feminism. commentaries about it since we did the last question, and I thought I might give the caveat that the military refers to drones as unmanned aerial systems, and we might think about what that term unmanned does to the category of masculinities. And what does it mean when the military itself is talking about power as something that is unmanned, um, which still leaves the man in there, but then negates the sort of recognition of what that man is. Um, why aren't they unwomaned? Um, what would that mean? Uh, a number of the drone pilots are women, um, so it, it could be unwomaned. Piloted vehicles as well, unpersoned. Um, and, and maybe that, in addition to the issues that were raised earlier, about the civilians and non-civilians who are targeted by these systems. So, thank you. I wouldn't really want to jump in because I feel so strongly about this. I want to just mention that, you know, when I mentioned the 2% uh, figure, which the Stanford and NYU report from three days ago has sort of specified, it was in response to arguments that I have with countless people who call themselves, you know, liberal, not left. You know, that, oh, well, you know, what's better than sending troops out there? Right? Isn't it better than sending troops out there? And so, and then, and we are doing it because we are, you know, look at all the good that's come out of it. We don't have a 
as much of a problem with Al Qaeda as it used to. So it's in response to that that I'm sort of using this figure, this because we're talking in numbers so much in this election campaign, right? Forty seven percent, ninety nine percent, so I said two percent, you know. Two percent, if you're into counting, two percent is an atrocity, right? Two percent of the people you claim to be it's only the people you claim to be killing only constitute two percent of the people killed. Mm -hmm. And if you're into counting, the people that we have killed, my tax dollars, your tax dollars have killed, are you know far greater than the people in whose name we carry out these attacks. So yes, I mean I totally agree with you that you know we should there is something very, very tricky about first of all naming our views and you're implying that there's something legitimate about sort of seeking out people in this extrajudicial manner. But it's really in response to these um, It's great, you're going to send us all copies of your dissertation. <laughs> no, I mean, really, right? Yes. I mean, you've got our names. <laughs> you know our universities, okay? I mean, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, how else are we going to get smarter? Um, because it really does say, um, if, you, if you don't, you can be a one handy and many are critics of the use of drones without any feminist curiosity. And one can say some very, very smart and useful and helpful, hopefully even devastating things without any feminist exploration of the drone strategy, the drone practice, the drone consequences. But I always ask, since I spent such a long time studying militaries, especially militaries, not even militaries, um, without having any feminist curiosity. And I look back now on what I missed. And so I think, well, if you then have a feminist analysis of the drones, how do you make us all smarter than, we, than you otherwise would be able to? And with the drones, one of the things that really a feminist analysis sheds light on, I think, is the very ambivalence that many militarists um, have towards soldiering. Because on the one hand, and this uh, I think is maybe particularly true in contemporary 21st century American version of militarism, and that is on the one hand, soldiering is held up as the epitome of a certain kind of, quote, patriotic masculinity. Um, and that's why soldiers are at football games doing their flag thing, right? Um, also, by the way, in high schools. That's why junior ROT students are now the ones who are chosen in public high schools to do the flag nationals. Very, very dangerous. But, so on the one hand, in American militarism, soldiering is really held up as being the epitome of um, uh, what militarism should look like if it supports nationalistic patriotism. But on the other hand, simultaneously, there is this infatuation with technology that is about detaching from what conventionally is known as, as masculinized soldiery. And it's a very patriarchal attachment to that kind of technology and the legitimation of it and the building of it. And you've got both those things going on at the same time, and I think it makes for a political ambivalence as well. And I don't think, I mean, this is, I'm just saying what I know is already in your dissertation, right? But for the rest of us, it says, if we don't, if we ask feminist questions, we're going to be smarter even about things, or maybe especially about things that don't look on the surface as if they've got anything to do with gender. We're going to be smarter about gold mining, for absolutely for sure. We are certainly going to be smarter about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and all the conflicts within the conflict. We are going to be smarter about toxic waste. We're going to be smarter about many things by asking feminist questions about drones. 
They won't be the only questions we'll ask. They sometimes won't be the most important questions that we ask. But sometimes they will be, and if we don't ask the questions, as we don't have a feminist curiosity about whatever it is we're interested in, we'll never know whether, in fact, they're the most important questions we should ask. Yes. Um, so, I don't know where to begin actually with this, but you are definitely in the right place to be studying this. Um, you know, we can take a ride over to Northern Virginia here. Just pass on by on the way to the airport, right? Okay. Um, so, drones. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I looked at with that is, or one of the intersections, I guess, with what I presented today, um, was thinking about a green war, this notion of green war, right? The way that um, there's all this tremendous effort within the DOD and the DOE uh, to, quote, make weapons less toxic, right? Which essentially means you can avoid, you know, it, it's not stockpiling and generating more weapons, but go back to the stockpile and kind of like futz around with them and update them and change up materials and so forth. So you have things like that going on. You also have the DOD being tremendously lobbying for, you know, climate change issues. I mean, there's just bizarre stuff happening under this banner of great war and drones could be perceived to be happening within that sphere. So that's one way you can kind of rotate around drones and think about this green of the military. Um, and part of that is you know, the detachment idea, um, the idea that you know it's not actually uh, you know, uh, killing soldiers or hurt, um, you know, sort of um, uh, mar or, or scarring you know, land, um, um, you know, by you know the aggressors. As in, um, in this kind of very colonial, not kind of very colonial present, you have this kind of this notion of unmanned or, or this idea of targets too, right? The production of targets, um, you know, is very much this this network. Of Ability, sort of a vertical geopolitics of exception and so forth, um, you know, that um, allows this kind of colonial presence to continue. And actually what's what's sort of um, interesting is to look at, um, what I thought was interesting is kind of look at kind of the, the networking that is going on of the, the, it's not just one person as a pilot of these things, right? I mean, you know this, but. Um, so it's interesting to see these protocols they put in place that very much dehumanize, they're purposely, you, you know, it's like these bizarre machinic interactions, right? That very much dehumanize. As a kind of operation, so it's it's interesting because then it's sort of unmanned, as in you know very unhumanized, dehumanized um, um, work. And I think one of the things, the last thing I say, sorry, I could go on and on, <laughs> is to think about this also in relationship to other things that are going on um, that seem to be the, the the study of these things seems to be incredibly gendered. In that um, you know landmines, in contrast, tends to be perceived as I mean it is a very highly gendered issue, right? Um, Navigating around on land, so it's interesting to see how um, different, you know, the different ways this has been taken up, and a kind of gender division of labor, even um, you know, on some of these topics themselves, actually. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think landmines is quite an interesting thing to sort of contrast, I guess, to you know, the kind of remains of this, you know, targeting and so forth, um, you know, the kind of vulnerability and toxicity and so forth that's um, going on, and and then of course you just kind of think again. Last point is just. Um, when I consider the relationships between the civilian and the military, for me, if for a variety of reasons, I uh, you know, see these as highly intertwined, and you see these kind of strategic divisions put into place um, to, to separate off any form of responsibility or accountability. So I'd be curious to see what happens when um, this tremendous, you know, this, this labor force that's you know, congealing around piloting these drones, right? And that kind of is not just the skill set itself, but also the kind of um, labor pool and um, so in the future, there's a lot of stress syndrome. People are really depressed, and I, I don't think we have a lot of uh, reported suicides yet. But there's a lot. Of, you know, there's, there's such a disjunction between going and piloting these things with these screens, this network of you know, operating these screens, and then you know going home to your family you know, or something like that, right? So there's a lot of you know there's a lot of psychological um, and you know, just physical health effects. So we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, it's kind of un supposedly unmanned. But that we are uh, leaving these discussions incomplete and unfinished. <laughs> so that, I mean, that, that is how feminist uh, horizon should look like, I think. So I thank you so much for wonderful speakers we had today and our audience who came on homecoming Saturday to spend time with us. <laughs> so um, I think I suggest that we'll conclude today's event by giving a big round of applause to all of us. Thank you and it's here.
um, the next 25 years are messy, confused, <laughs> but she's truthfully and geographically responsible. <laughs> Thank you.